Hi, I'm Constance Duke, Director of Sustainability at Sustain Life. This is the Week in Sustainability, where our team of practitioners and experts get together to talk about important issues and stories in sustainability this week. As you may have noticed, our fearless leader, Alyssa, is not available today, but I am joined by my colleagues, Hannah and Nick. Please introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Hannah. I'm Sustain.Life's new sustainability data analyst. I am really excited to be joining the podcast and this week. Welcome to the team, Hannah. Thank you. And I'm Nick Lusantag. I'm a senior manager on our sustainability team. Great, thank you both. So we have a couple of topics that we want to cover today, one of them being greenwashing, which has garnered quite a few headlines again over the past few weeks. And then there's the California ban on natural gas furnaces by 2030, um, kind of the first statewide ban of its kind uh, that comes right on the heels of California's gasoline powered car ban, uh, which we just covered a few weeks ago. Uh, Nick or Hannah, would you like to kick us off with some insights on this new development in the Golden State? Sure. I'll just kick us off. Uh, California banned uh, natural gas furnaces and water heaters starting in 2030. Um, this is a much more significant ban than what we've seen in other states and municipalities, mostly municipalities, namely New York City and Boston, which banned natural gas or rather uh, mandated all electric new construction. Uh, this actually applies to all buildings in, in 2030. So all types of, um, you know, whether you're a residential homeowner or a commercial building developer, um, this applies to you. So pretty, pretty big deal. Um, and just like when we talked about the, uh, the ice car, the combustion engine car ban um, that came out a few weeks ago, this is the gift that keeps on giving because as the, the grid grows greener, um, then the emissions reductions will get larger. And just as, as Nick is talking about how it uh, connects to other bans happening in California, this is all sort of part of a suite of measures that California is putting forth on making sure that they are, are lowering their um, eight hour ozone standard. So they're no longer compliant and are working really hard to, to gain compliance after the limit uh, was um, dropped in 2015. So. I think that this is, we're going to see more of this from California. We saw the gas stove ban that's, I believe, hitting in 2023. Um, so homeowners and, and building developers are concerned. I think it's really, it's cool to see. Yeah, and it's kind of yeah. um, a holistic solution because it's about reducing ozone. It's about reducing uh, nitrous oxide. It's about reducing PM 2.5, which is not necessarily greenhouse gas, but is a public health issue. Uh, along with CO2. So it kind of hits it on multiple heads, which is great. Sorry. Yeah, questions. I think that's a really, no, that's a really important point um, with the with the LA um, gas stove ban too, that climate change was not actually the motivation for this. It was public yeah. health issues. Um, and there are carcin carcinogens being emitted like benzene, for instance, from leaking gas stoves. So there there are other motivations besides climate change, but um, obviously, this is part of an entire strategy within the state of California, um, and it, it is important to note that there are rebates for the transition. Um, I looked into those a little bit. Um, you know, a customer can receive up to almost five thousand um, dollars if they're low income or single family residential, and then everyone else can get up to thirty eight hundred dollars, which does uh, seem a little bit low for California. So I think the estimates I saw for kind of transitioning all of your appliances from natural gas to electricity can run from anywhere from five to $20,000, uh, depending on the age of your home and whether your panel needs to be upgraded. Um, so there are definitely some concerns about how people will manage this financially. And are Absolutely. you assuming heat pumps as, this, as the replacement there? Um, uh, Constance? I, yeah, I think heat pumps were part of that um, for sure. And and also those estimates were for transitioning all of your appliances, not just your mm -hmm. water heater. Mm -hmm. uh, but although water heaters are part of um, this transition too. Uh, but yeah, heat pumps, water heaters, uh, stoves. Yeah, I was kind of wondering about like California being a milder climate if electric resistive heating would make a comeback um, 
from the 80s or whenever it was big. Uh, maybe not the greatest thing, you know, for, for people who don't know, electric resistive heating is just a very simply heating, a heating element. It's how your toaster works. Um, and heat pumps are three to four times more efficient than that. Um, and so would installing heat pumps, though they may be more expensive, a little more mechanically complicated, would um, save a lot more energy. And Constance, yeah. do you know how the California specific rebates will will or will not be uh, able to be sort of compounded with IRA rebates that also try to target homeowners making that changeover? Yeah, so it sounds like they're cumulative right yeah. now. Well, obviously you can't, if, if you've already transitioned to something, you can't get the rebate from both places for the same um, for the same upgrade. Um, but yeah, you can definitely draw from both to make the overall transition. Uh, but one thing I'm actually really more concerned about even is if the supply chains are going to be able to handle this. Like we're seeing a lot of these bans, um, you know, related to electrification. We know that um, I think it was uh, maybe PNG that's already having trouble buying transformers. And so... Um, yeah, kind of concerned about how the supply chain is going to manage this this new demand for uh, all of these appliances. Um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about uh, city bans too, because we, you know, as we said, this is a statewide ban, but we are seeing um, these things definitely being enacted at the municipal level too, um, which which is important. I don't know, uh, Nick, you're in New York City. Maybe you can speak to what's happening there. Well, New York City, you know, as I mentioned, we have uh, all electric mandate for new buildings starting in 20. Um, actually, it's 2027, I think, uh, somewhere around there, 2027, 2030. But, you know, that's kind of overshadowed by our our larger what's called local law 97, which is um, just emissions limits in general on buildings, which are which are driving a lot of retrofits and and upgrades because the fines are are very significant. Uh, and that basically sets a limit for the type and size of your building on how much you can emit. Um, and, and starting in 2025, I think about a quarter of New York City buildings will be out of compliance. Um, and so that combined with this all electric mandate is is um, driving a lot of change. And something else I think about is in New York City, you know, heating is required to be provided by the landlord. Um, I think that's the case in a lot of places. When you electrify, you have a heat pump. Like I, I'm in an all electric apartment. I have heat pumps in, in my apartments. I'm a renter. I pay all the electric. So they, it's a way for landlords to transfer a lot of the utility costs onto the renters. And a lot of times that's not, um, that's not really transparent when you're, when you're signing up for, for an apartment. If you, if you have a resistive water heater and even heat pumps, it can, it can be quite expensive. Um, so that is something that I'm kind of curious to see how that evolves as we have more all electric multifamily buildings here in New York City, if, if the city is going to step in to help alleviate some of those costs. Yeah, that's really interesting, especially because we know that heat pumps overall are more cost effective than the alternatives. But it's it's interesting to see how this can still cause issues when the cost is passed on, um, you know, especially for vulnerable um groups or low-income families. Yeah, yeah, it's another challenge here because the cost of electricity is is very high relative to natural gas. And so the operational costs of electrifying are still on the higher end, um, though they're coming down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so how do we think this is going to impact other states? So with, with cars, it was pretty obvious, right? So if you have a state leading these types of efforts, uh, and people are buying from that market, it's it's ultimately going to catch on. But now we're in a situation where we have at least 20 states in the country um, who have preemption laws on the books. And so it's really difficult for those states to transition um, based on their conservative legislature to, you know, bans of natural gas appliances, for instance. Well, I, I right. think I'll go ahead. Go ahead. Anna. I, I just think a lot of this is... Um... Like you're saying, this, certain states face certain blocks because they're not feeling the effects of climate change as much in those moments. I think a lot of the action that we're sitting, seeing in California is directly caused by the fact that it's felt so deeply on a local level. Um, 
and that can be said for a lot of different places, but California has sort of this momentum around feeling the effects of climate change and having legislatures that are willing to do something about it, whereas a lot of states are lagging in that um, in that sort of perspective. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it sort of gives a, a political playbook, but um, but yeah, if you have a conservative legislature, then um, then it's hard to overcome those roadblocks. But I do think, Constance, you mentioned supply chain issues with uh, with demand increasing. But um, if if we can sort of overcome those, then presumably costs will come down for a lot of these technologies, and the, that'll be shared by you know states that are in California. Uh, which can help, you know, drive change elsewhere just through things being cheaper to do. Yeah, really good point. Cost is always a great driver still. So overall, we we do see this as a really positive development. Um, there are some kinks to work out, including um, how costs will be distributed. But uh, obviously for the climate, this is the right decision. And having a statewide ban just really accelerates the transition to electrification versus every municipality just kind of catching on one by one. Right, let's dive into our second topic, uh, greenwashing. So there's been quite a bit going on. Uh, I came ab about this uh, lawsuit against H&M, which was a couple of months ago. Um, where a New York student uh, had actually sued H&M for greenwashing. They have this conscious collection line, which they say is more environmentally friendly. Um, and so the student claims that she paid a premium for this conscious collection um, item, um, thinking it used less water uh, than average and turned out um, producing this line of clothing actually uses more water. Um, and so that's how you know the lawsuit came about. Um, and we understand that one of the challenges here was that uh, H&M used an average water indicator when they did the life cycle assessment of their product. And you know, unfortunately, averages only lead to estimates. Um, so when people take these carbon labels seriously or these environmental labels seriously, um, you can see how that can lead to issues. And then we're seeing similar lawsuits in the UK. Um, ASOS is in one. Um, Boohoo is having another issue. So uh, great leeway or, or great, um, you know, kind of transition into questions around fast fashion in general. Can fast fashion ever be sustainable? And also, why are we seeing this resurgence of greenwashing? Yeah, I mean, I, to your to your second question, I think a big part of it is like. There's so much data now. There are so many analyses out there, which is great, but it also allows for a lot of cherry picking of of data. Uh, you can pick, you know, oh, we're only going to show, you know, a couple's the water intensity of a couple stages of the product, not the whole thing. And we'll, you know, people won't really read through the document and notice. And I think this is why this is why ESG frameworks, reporting frameworks, are so important, is because they establish the rules. For by which everybody reports these types of numbers. And so you know that this number is probably calculated in a reliable way and everybody's numbers are sort of apples to apples. When you leave it up to a company, then then it's pretty easy to just pick the numbers that make you look favorable. And in fast fashion, I mean, it's I feel like by definition, it's not sustainable, so. Right. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I think that's a really interesting point, too, about consumers being so much more educated that they're actually catching these types of things, right? Because it used yeah. to be that companies were kind of leading on this and they were the first ones to do LCAs and kind of understand how this process works. And now you have consumers who are so savvy that they know how to kind of investigate um, product claims and come to their own conclusions. Uh, but also raises the question, uh, you know, are these lawsuits... Uh, for greenwashing more beneficial or are they causing more harm in that it will make companies more reluctant to disclose this kind of data? Will it make companies more reluctant to disclose this kind of data or will it just make companies that were going to do it wrong more reluctant? I, I would hope that the lawsuits like this, although sort of large fast fashion fast fashion companies will always have the ability to sort of withstand the lawsuit a little bit more than the patience of the consumer. But I I wonder if 
getting called out loudly allows a little bit more rigor on the part of the producer. Yeah, hopefully it just pushes companies that are really doing the right thing to be more courageous and being vocal about it because they know that, you know, these numbers that we're publishing, we stand by them and they they actually reflect our business. Um, I kind of have the, the opposite fear, which is that greenwashing is generally so successful in marketing that companies will just do it all the time because although con- some consumers uh, will cash them, most most won't. And um, yeah. Well, we have we have another example of someone sort of being called out, right? Which was Mercedes with its nature-based ads, and of course these uh, these ads were related to their um, electric vehicles. But essentially, they took nature images and just kind of overlaid their logo, and then this activist group came out and overlaid the logo over images of climate change and basically accused Mercedes of greenwashing, and it went viral on social media. Um, The sad part that I found about this was that instead of kind of taking accountability for the messaging um, as a company at large, Mercedes just kind of blamed it on their Mexican um, division and said that, you know, the English translation was never approved. And so um, (laughs) I think it's, it's another good lesson that one, when you talk about sustainability, you have to be kind of humble about how you talk about it. And then two, if you do make a mistake or even if you just have challenges that lead to mistakes you know like honest mistakes um just be transparent and and take accountability i think that would resonate with consumers more so than you know trying to kind of wriggle your way out of it well that that reminds me of the the kia suv commercial constants that you had sent me where the guy is using his suv to pick up trash on the beach He's like driving on the beach and then there's at the end, there's a shot of like baby sea turtles um, crawling to the ocean. It's just like part of it is used. To, I mean, they weren't explicitly making any claims about their product. It's it's a fossil fuel vehicle, um, but mixing the imagery in and this idea that like, oh, it's a green product because you can pick up trash with it. Um, but it's just so it's so backwards. Um, but yeah, I get a good kick out of that one. Yeah, and more people will see that commercial than will read about the sort of discussion afterwards. Like more people will see the the sort of bad Kia commercial than will hear the complaints made by activists. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, that that one was really unfortunate. So it it was that there was a rake attached to the car that was being right, yeah. you know used to rake the beach and. Um, yeah, we can't even begin to talk about all the issues with that. You know, including that rakes don't pick up microplastics, um, which are obviously hurting the sea turtles. Uh, And, you know, you obviously shouldn't drive your car over sensitive coastal areas. So there's there's so much wrong with this ad. Um, But yeah, I mean, everybody is trying to capitalize on green messaging. Yeah. One of my favorites, it's a little more innocent, but it's the Cascade dishwasher detergent commercial with uh, Freddie Prince Jr. and Sarah Michelle Gellar. And they're talking about how they run the dishwasher every night. Well, first they talk about how, you know, using the dishwasher is better than cleaning dishes by hand, which is true if you have an Energy Star dishwasher. Um, But then they jump to, therefore, you should run your dishwasher every night. And it's like, well, just because it's better than washing your dishes by hand doesn't mean you need to run it every night. Like, still run it when it's full. Um, It's just like such a... I don't know. It's a crazy leap that they take of like fake logic. Um, but obviously, I, I think it's interesting partially because like Cascade doesn't make dishwashers. They make the detergent and they want you to buy 365 detergent pods a year. Um, mm-hmm. And so they're trying to use the ener- the water efficiency of the product to justify using it every single day. Um, but there there is a better way. Just use it when it's full. Do it once or twice a week. Great. Yeah. There was also um, a recent report from the European Commission that showed that 42% of companies' uh, green claims are exaggerated, false, or deceptive, which is a pretty staggering number, Mm -hmm. you know, with everything we know now and the, the access we have to you know, getting fairly accurate data and and also kind of understanding that 
we still have a lot of work to do um, to get where we need to be. So yeah, I, I found this really surprising. You know, we have the FTC green guides. Um, it's yeah, it's it's surprising that companies are still resorting to this much greenwashing. Yeah. Um, a, a couple of things that I want to mention, I do want to mention that zero targets can be a form of greenwashing. A lot of companies now are publishing net zero targets uh, without necessarily a plan on how they get there, or they're calling them net zero targets, but they're relying entirely on offsets. And that is a form of greenwashing. It looks really great. It sounds really ambitious, but um, many of them are just planning on spending a lot of money to pay their way out of their their emissions and that's why we need things like science-based targets we need standards to align around so that we know everybody is kind of credible and legitimate in their claims yeah and i i do think it's important to also note that a lot of companies are not purposely misleading um you know they're adopting buzzwords and everybody's you know all of our competitors are, competitors are setting net zero targets let's just set the target and then figure out how to get there um and we know this is difficult we know it's difficult to measure your emissions in a meaningful way i mean this is what we work on every day um and so you know sometimes um you know, you you don't really have a strategy yet or a plan to get there, and that's something that obviously companies need to urgently work towards. Or if they do perform an LCA, you know, maybe they had uh, you know incomplete data as inputs, and they're just trying to get a result with the data they have available to them. So um, yeah, I, I think as consumers, we have to have realistic expectations, you know, around what we can expect from companies. Um, who are a lot of times also still new to this. Um, but at the same time, and this is why I keep saying when you do talk about sustainability, you have to be humble about it and understand your limitations and be transparent about them. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. All right, team. Well, this was a great discussion. Thank you both so much. And to our listeners, we will see you next week for more commentary on the week's sustainability stories. Bye, everyone.